with all doubts, I think it's by far the best league in the world. How dare you score like that in the Premier League? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition. It is actually edition week eight of the American Scouser TV Premier League show match week eight review. I am Galley up here in Massachusetts. There's not much to complain about the weather. I'm sure at some point tonight we'll figure out a way. And Bickler joins us from Carolina tonight. I'm assuming you're in Carolina, correct? I am where the mornings are starting to feel like fall. Finally, it's like been the first week where you haven't stepped out and it's like 80 degrees and humid as a swamp in it. It feels great in the morning. I will say yesterday or the day before it was actually pretty warm. I went outside. I was like, wow, I'm like wearing shorts. And then this morning I went outside and realized like in a week, I'm going to have to scrape frost off my window in the Northeast to go to work in the morning. So the first frost came uh, walked the dog tonight before the uh, getting ready for this, and there were people ripping up their flower beds because you know the first frost came and their perennials are dead. Um, so it was interesting here. It's that like rite of passage. It's that time in New England when we go from bitching about how warm it is to bitching about the fact that we love fall for one month just until winter gets here so we can hate it. Um, but we'll save that for another day when we get there. So, like always. We'll start here um, focusing a little bit on the results. We're going to do it a little different this week where we pick apart more specifics out of games and talk about full matches. But I did want to talk about, you know, pick kind of one match out here looking at the full uh, sheet, maybe like a shock of the week or something that really surprised you. And, you know, there's lots of results here that we're going to touch on, like the United match and the Liverpool match and, of course, the match of the week between Arsenal and Manchester City. But one of the more surprising overall results is probably Everton 3, Bournemouth nil. It's not as much that I didn't see Bournemouth laying an egg because God knows I love to give Bournemouth some flack. But Everton has struggled so much, Paul, at scoring goals and really struggled, struggled at Goodison. Bournemouth at time has played some sides really tough so far this year just without results. Um, does this say more about Everton starting to turn the corner or the Bournemouth manager maybe going down a slippery slope that he can't get himself back from? Yeah, I, I kind of want to start. I, not that I don't want to give Everton their credit, right? But the, I almost want to say the latter just because we've spoken yep. about this team and how much they've they've struggled defensively. I feel like there's some, something fundamentally broken if you get three scored on you by Everton in this Everton side right now. So, I mean, it's not like Everton has exactly been in any sort of run of form. I jokingly said I didn't know that they put 35 goals in this year, and then, then I started to say, like, I started to lean into that a little more seriously as we continued to the season. But, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, there's something fundamentally broken with your system if that Everton team comes in and scores three. And not only did they score three, they consistently created chances. It wasn't like it wasn't like Bournemouth hold a lot of play and Everton just got – three shots at it was clinical. Yeah, I, I kind of felt the same way. The one thing I will say to Everton, um, this was the first match all year that they were able to start Dominic Calvert-Lewin, uh, Abdel Decore, and Jack Harrison. And I think people didn't even realize they picked up Jack Harrison right at the end of the window from Leeds. And I think that's a guy who can actually help them because he's proven he can score Premier League goals from wide positions and he can create goals. And he did that on the pitch on Sunday. I mean, er, on Saturday, his goal was really well taken. The goal he scored, he created, uh, I think the third or had the key pass leading up to the goal. goal. Um, and you can just see they're a different side when Dominic Calvert-Lewin is playing through the middle. And we all love to poke fun, you know, from the GQ covers to his crazy hairstyles to the fashion. Um, but, you know, when he is fit and firing, he is a proven Premier League goal scorer and proven to the point where he can score you 10 to 15 goals over a 30-game season if he can give you that many appearances. Now, whether he can give that many appearances is, you know, definitely uh, the jury is out on that one. But as Everton starts to rack up points 
and occasionally picks them up against sides we don't expect them to, I think they may slightly separate themselves more and more because you're starting to see Sean Dyche's identity at the club. Um, you know, uh, we love to make fun of the fact that, you know, James Tarkowski is his, you know, captain and center back. And what do you expect when you bring Burnley center back of 2018 in and expect that you're going to do things differently in 2023? But he's also got the young Brathwaite kid playing really, really well. And I think if he can get center back play, Sean Jice has proven he can figure out a way to get a side to – I mean, hell, he got those Burnley sides to 35, 40 points when that's what it took to stay up. If all he has to do is get Everton to 30, 32 points, I think he'll probably be able to do it. It's not going to be easy, but I don't know that it's going to be as dire as we all kind of maybe did victory laps through the first two, three weekends because it looked like it could be even worse than the last couple of years. And I'm not sure that's going to be the case. <clears throat> I mean, I think you hit a good point. I think a lot of this comes down to the fact that, like, look, Ducori has been their most consistent offensive output, even though he's not an offensive player, for a while now. DLC has been out of the picture. He comes back in. He is their most consistent goal-scoring threat. And then you throw in your X Factor and Jack Harrison. So I do think if those three players can stay fit, and, and they can build a nucleus around that, they do have a shot because you know that they're going to improve defensively just over the course of the season, just based on the body of work and what Dyche does. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, it pains me to say it, but he's probably the perfect – we said he might be the perfect manager to try to smash and grab them into a save, and I don't think it had anything to do with him as much as, much as it was just kind of the luck and the rub of the green of the other teams around them last year faltering. Um, but I, I will say to be fair to him for, especially for how poor they started, they really could have folded up shop a couple times. Now, if you look at the fixture trackers, they played a pretty easy opening run of eight fixtures. So for them to not have accumulated more points is probably worrisome for them. Um, but I still just kind of, when you look at how bad the teams around them are, you know, and, and this is with them dropping points to Luton, um, I still feel like they have a good chance, and that has as much to do with how bad Luton and Sheffield United are, uh, but I'm sure we'll get to that a little bit. So we're going to take a little bit of a different approach to our kind of round-robin talking points here and kind of take our talking points around the grounds. And and we'll talk about each of these five matches um, in a little bit more detail, but I want to specifically focus on some of the things that we're seeing in the graphics. So let's start with what was the first match of the weekend. Um, I mean, you want to talk about not showing up for a morning kickoff. Uh, Spurs go to Luton, really do nothing to deserve a point. Um, they get the goal from Mickey Van Deveen, who, uh, as you know, Liverpool supporters, we talked about a lot this summer, is really looking the part, both with his pace, his power, he looks calm on the ball. Looks a good buy by Spurs. They go up 1-0 um, after Ibs Basuma is sent off for what I would argue, Paul, should be something that not only gets you fined and like paying all the prices through the kangaroo courts, but really in some ways should should really get you looked at with a like a, a sideways eye from your own teammates. Because, I mean, a dive is one thing. A dive outside the box when you just picked up a yellow that is so blatantly obvious to the point that a match day official awards it. I mean, literally, is this bonehead move of the year so far? Are we at that level already? Uh, I mean, we've seen enough of Anthony Gordon that he probably still, like trumps him somewhere along the line. But like, I and this is crazy because I I, I actually like Basuma as a player, so like this was a little bit surprising to me. But yeah, like. Of all the rule changes and all the refereeing things that we talk about, like I love this. And I loved it not because it came from a rival of Liverpool. I loved it because like these are the cards that I want to see. Like this is the stuff that matters. Like this is the stuff that has to go out of the game. Who cares if somebody takes too long on a throw in? 
You know what I mean? Like add it to extra yeah. time. Do what you got to do. Like of all the dumb shit we talk about, like this is the, this is the stuff that matters because this is the stuff that ruins a game when you're playing like teams like Brentford or teams that like, or any of the Spanish teams in the Champions League. Like, like this is the stuff that really, really puts a bad mark on the game. Not only for people that are fans of it, for people that are trying to get into the sport. Like this is one of the most unappealing parts of it. And I know all the professional sports are so sort of going the way of the flop, but like, I would love to see this be a point of emphasis of all the shit we talk about. I would love for this to be one. So Spurs do get their three points though. It was not uh, convincing by any means. They do win with 10 men, which is impressive in itself. I thought Luton had some opportunities second half. You know, they had three or four really good opportunities fall, and none of them fell to the one man on the pitch in uh, Carlton Morris who could actually put the ball in the back of the net. And if any of them fall to Morris, they probably level it up and who knows, maybe go on and even steal themselves a win, if not a point. Um, the second graphic here, probably – the most bittersweet moment of the whole weekend is watching United come back one nil and winning late like that, because in your heart as a Liverpool supporter and as well, as I like to call it, anyone but a United supporter, your heart just goes back to like the late nineties, early aughts, right? Where they would just do this constantly with multiple goals and extra time at home to stop a coup. But there's something warm and fuzzy about the fact that they have to go route one football. Like they could have just saved a billion dollars and left David Moyes in charge at the club and just kicked the ball and lumped it up and had a big bloke like Harry Maguire knock it down off a header and, and some Scottish freak like McTominay bang it in. Um, but I just found it hilarious that they had to go long ball, route one football to get goals, to salvage a win that came directly from guys – that Ten Hag has done everything he could to jettison out of the club and vilify. The fans were booing McTominay at the end of the window and McGuire for not taking West Ham's pay cuts. And now they're singing their names. And I actually saw United supporters and talk groups today saying Harry Maguire must start the next match. Like they're calling for Harry Maguire and Johnny Evans in 2023. And I can't get enough of it. You know what? Like, I'm going to say something crazy. Manchester United supporters don't deserve Harry Maguire. They, <laughs> they don't. You're right. You're right. They don't. He's more loyal it, than they are. It's the craziest thing to say out loud, but it's true. And, like, I had absolute, like, you know, it's, it's tough to find, as a Liverpool supporter, it's tough to find a lot of joy out of a United win. But I did just chuckle at the fact that it was just players that they've been trying to get rid of for multiple windows coming in and winning it in, in injury time in the final death gasp of that game after laying an absolute egg. It was it was it was pretty amazing. So what is it? But what does this say about Brentford, who is a side who's not playing as well as maybe some of their results show? Actually, like there are results or two away from finding themselves sucked into the real bad zone. Um, with some of the mediocre teams. They look like a bottom half, a second half, bottom of the table team. Um, love the manager. Love what they do. You know, love the Danish invasion. But is it is it starting to run its course? Is their style of play it, starting yeah, to get it seems overdone like every and week it, down? Yeah, it feels like every week it's kind of devolving at this rate. You know, the only consistent one you've got is Jensen. That's getting some output. But, like, really, like, it does feel like, I mean, this side just desperately misses Ivan Tony. I think. You know what I mean? And I think, like, uh, you know, you got to uh, – Boima and Lisa got away for – you know, they held it up for a little bit. But it seems like – it, it, it doesn't seem like there's any real sort of uh, central focus for that side. And I think that like it, it, it's a team that sort of lacks a go-to identity right now. And I think like they, they kind of got through it and, and we thought they might be okay, but it seems like with every week it's sort of devolving um, with less and less of like sort of an identity identifiable attack in that team, which is really what they brand their football on. So, I mean, this isn't a team that's built to defend. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what this looks like. 
Yeah, and, and we can poke fun at United, and I can make jokes about, you know, it's Maguire and Evans, McCominay and long balls, and that just makes me laugh because it's United. But the truth is, you know, if it isn't for an Onana, another Onana Howler, just a terrible – I mean, at, at the point when Brentford had the one nothing lead, they had one shot on target, and it went in the back of the net, and it bounced off his wrist and went in. And, you know, it's just getting worse and worse for him to the point where – you question whether or not at some point Ten Hag is going to have to like give him a break to just try to get his head right. But it's not even like they have backups that, you know, it's not like they still have, you know, Dean Henderson, who's got Premier League experience behind him. They have a kid who couldn't hold down the Fernabachi number one job and is now, you know, waiting for a shot to be the backup at United or an 850 year old Tom Heaton. So either way, David De Gea is just sitting on a couch somewhere laughing, cashing checks on Ten Hag's dollar. Uh, but we'll move on uh, as we go around the ground here. Wolves won, Villa won. Wolves finished with 10 men. Um, but the truth of the matter is Wolves can play with 10 men as long as that one man whose picture's on the screen because he's the only chance they have of doing anything because he's the only player in that side that could play for, in my opinion, any side – and I'm, I'm going to go a step beyond. I believe Pedro Neto can play for any side in the world, not any side in the Premier League. Now, could he be a perfect fit at Barcelona? Would he be great at Real Madrid? I don't know what clubs would be good. But he could go to Italy and he could play for AC Milan or Juventus. He could go and play for Bayern. I'm confident he could walk in right now, and I think he would have started this weekend for Pep at Arsenal with who he has available to him. Um, probably on the left-hand side over Doku, to be honest. The guy can do everything right and left, creates goals. He was a menace again on uh, on the weekend on Sunday. How good is this player? Where? How much longer can Wolves really hold on to him? Uh, well, I don't know if I'm as high on him as you are, just because, and I'll say this. I, I mean, I think he's playing outstanding football right now. I need to see it. I need to see it for longer. Okay, like I need to see it for more because I we've seen this in spurts, and I think through whether it be injury or the lineup, he's been locked out a few times. So I mean, maybe this is just what he needed, right? Maybe he just needed this extended run to bed back in. Uh, but I need to see it for a little bit longer. I, I do think that if this continues, though, I don't think Wolves are going to hang on to him. They're just not a club that do that um, or have the means to do it. And I think he'll probably be a, a similar to Jota out for a hefty fee. Um, somewhere nice that he can land. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, he, they're creating – I mean, I think the entire team for Wolves is actually playing okay. I mean, we talked about this last week when we are like, does 1-1 one, one mean more? Does this result mean, like, say more about Wolves or does it say more about City? And I said, well, I think these are two teams headed in different directions. And I think that the results this weekend sort of bore that out. I know they didn't get three points. City dropped points. But I do see, like – Wolves here playing a very, very good Villa team and holding their own defensively and creating their own opportunities. So I think he uh, – Wolves are headed in the right direction, and I think he's a part of everything that's good for them right now. So, yeah, I think he's a great player, but probably not there for, for an extended run. Like, I can't see him last in – does he make it through next summer? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I don't think he does if he plays this way because yeah. he was on his way out Basically, two, you know, there were clubs, Arsenal, I think, Tottenham, even we were a little bit, you know, I, Paul, he would have been the perfect underling to, he would have been a perfect Mo Salah cover as a young player with upside when we would have bought him because yep. he would have bought him at 35, 40 million, not the 60 or 70 that they'll probably demand now. He had that brutal leg injury that ended up having a major setback off on international duty, and we'll probably touch on the international break at some point uh, as well. You know, I, I just think that he has – you know what it is with him? There's certain players you see, and you see that they have that kind of like stardust-type player in their boots. And I feel like it's kind of like what we see with Porto with, when we watch Luis Diaz highlights. And then when you see him play with Liverpool, you're like, wow, this guy's so much better playing with these guys. And I feel like he has one of those skill sets that if you put him, even in a United side, if you put him in a City side and you put him around talented players in front and behind him, not just waiting for him to do great things. I think he could be in, in just such a better player. And I think that's what he yeah, that's has fair. in front of him. But he's got to, but he has to earn that right. And you know what? 
part of the reliability is availability. So a guy who's been available but hasn't been picked, but that might be changing soon, um, might just be who I picked, I think, at one point as maybe the signing of the summer or what could be a shock signing of the summer. And that was West Ham, in my opinion's absolute coup of bringing in Mohamed Kudis. Um, he hasn't gotten many minutes. Did you see the goal? Obviously, on the weekend, uh, 88th minute, he had scored in the Europa League. He, by all accounts, was frustrated with David Moyes for not giving him a start, thinking he'd earned a start. Um, I'd say he gave the manager something to think about before the next Premier League match with that quick performance in the 88th minute and burying one past Nick Pope and really ending what was a perfect week by the traveling West, uh, Newcastle supporters. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a player that a lot of Liverpool supporters, you know, we've been linked with him in the past, and I think a lot of us like the idea of this this, this kid. He's 5'9", he's built like a tank. He's so, like, he's just so solid. Like, I mean, we talk about, like, you know, how it's tougher for these shorter players sometimes coming into the Prem from outside the Prem, but, like, man, that dude's got such a low center of gravity, and he's so good, like – I um, I, he's gonna be a fun player to watch. Yeah, West Ham have a real gem on their hands. They got a really good one. Um, I, I think it's um, I think it's them preparing for life without Bowen. But I mean, man, if they can hang on to both, they got something really nice going. Um, it's a the- crazy world when you're preparing for life without a guy that you gave a seven year extension to on the weekend. Um, Bowen signed a contract through 2030 at West Ham making him the highest paid player in club history. Now, we all know that's also to secure a higher fee and make it that much more for Liverpool or United or Arsenal or Tottenham or whatever big club from England tries to come in. Because let's be real, again, Jared Bowen's one of these guys. If his name was Bowenista, he'd have offers from Milan and Juventus with the way he plays. But because his name is Jared Bowen and he looks like he eats gravel – and once kicked a kid at a Hull City playground, right? Like, because of that, he's never going to play anywhere but England. Like, Jared Bowen's going to play in England till he can't, and then someone in Scotland's going to give him a contract yeah. to kick people in the He, he does look like country. someone that just has a collection of broken pool sticks in the back of his car. Like, Absolutely. That's a perfect example <laughs> of it. Like, it's everything that was, like, from the, you know, all the – uh all the street fighter type freaking broken glass and all that stuff. Like Jared Bowen's like the type of guy that just basically sits at the street fight and looks at the whole group and is like, come on. And he probably is like the nicest lad who drinks red wine, but I won't let that ruin my good, uh, (laughs) my good jokes and my overall opinion of it. Um, So we'll, we'll end it here with Liverpool to Brighton two. interesting match painful for some, at least two of the uh, hosts of this show watching it. But I want to focus, uh, start with Brighton. I want to talk about Deserby and his rotation and more importantly, his youth. I, I believe with Igor, um, Simon Adingra, and then Baleba making their debuts, two of which made starts. Um, I think Adingra had, start, Adingra had started one other Premier League match. But that is now five teenagers that Deservey has given his outright debut to in the Premier League so far this year. Um, This guy walked on the pitch and Andy Robertson is still spinning his head around asking people if they saw the license plate of what just ran over him. Like we went into the match thinking about licking our chops about Sully Marsh defending uh, Mo Salah. And the biggest lopsided one-on-one match all match long was this kid going down the right-hand flank and attacking Andy Robertson. Um, How do they do it? And honestly, is like this guy actually looks like he's like he's better than what they've had out there before him. Getting kind of scary, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, they're recruiting like we did, like in sort of Klopp's early days when we were getting some really, really good young gems in um, and being able to get people serious playing time. I mean, they're making it work. They're All those dudes came in, and all of them look like they belong. That's the thing. 
The thing is not like the fact that they're giving these kids chances. The thing is that they're hitting on these kids, like all of them. And I think like, I think, yeah, whatever they're doing is probably, you know, is definitely, they are as an organization, sort of the crown jewel of the Prem right now. I mean, we talk about all these big clubs, right? We talk about Arsenal. We talk about City. We talk about Liverpool. We talk about what's happening at Tottenham. But these guys, for where they should be in the Prem, based on how they've operated um, from floor to ceiling, running a class organization with some of the most exciting football, it, it's cool to see. It's very, very cool. I think it's very good for the league to see that from a non-traditional power. Um, and for a, a city with the history like Brighton to get these European nights this year, that's that's pretty special. Um, it's cool, man. I mean, I, I really enjoyed seeing it happen. And, and, yeah, I don't know what they're doing, but I am loving how they recruit um, across the board. We talked about how they've got the South American pipeline, right? But, I mean, they're doing it with Belgian kids. Like, you know, they're doing it like with – like they're doing it across the board, which is very, very cool to see. Yeah, I, I thought the um... – I thought the the I don't know how you pronounce it properly, Baleba or Baliba. I thought the the central midfielder that they granted his first start, the 19-year-old, I thought he was absolutely amazing. I thought when he made the run uh in the first half and took it all the way down and literally took it from about 10, 10 yards inside his own pitch, dribbled it to the Liverpool box, and then unleashed a shot and had Allison sprawling. And it just went wide of the post. And he he pulled his shirt over his head because the kid knew. Like, I was this close to, like, basically having my Dimitri Payet moment. And I'm 19, and hopefully I'll have a lot more than just that moment. Um, not the one Dimitri Payet season. But I, I, I looked at that play, and I thought to myself, wow, another destroyer in the midfield. Like, another player. And and honestly, that was really the problem for Liverpool was, was that, you know, McAllister was dropping. It was just, he was pushing forward. The defense was creating spaces behind. They were exploiting those spaces and then they were just picking us off and our defense was making mistakes. And, you know, when we talk about the defense, obviously Salah gets his brace. I heard some people say they thought it was a good performance by Liverpool. I, I thought Liverpool played okay. I thought they played good for what they had available to them. A little short man. I also thought they played really well for about 15 minutes in the first half where they create it, they put the pressure, they created the penalty, they score the goal. Um, did you feel that that was a point earned two points dropped? Probably a fair result for the fact that we easily could have conceded two more after they drew level at two, two. Yeah. I mean, it can't help but feel like points dropped off the back of like, you know, the pen, in a fairly dominant play, uh, grabbing Birch off the crossbar to make it 3-1. You know, like it felt like – to me it felt like points dropped. I thought we were very average across the board. I, I just felt like it was pretty average. I felt like – man, dude, I feel like this is just the third game on the run where we've gotten outmanaged by Brighton. Like straight up outmaneuvered. I felt like – I didn't like the fact that we didn't start with a six. I mean, we put McAllister back there again. I don't know what the point in us going and buying a rotational piece is a stopgap. That's a six. If we're not going to play him in this spot when we're down, man. It didn't make sense to me. Um, and I thought the fact that, you know, McAllister does what he did. Great midfielder. Didn't have his best game. Caught too far forward. Created gaps between our defense and our midfield that they exposed. And then the flip side, you know, we just – we missed Gakpo. There was not no. There wasn't a continuity between midfield and the front line. Um, I think Gakpo kind of creates that cohesiveness in the way he drops deep. Um, so yeah, I just thought there were fundamental pieces that like Liverpool didn't execute from both like a formation standpoint and from a tactical standpoint. And I didn't think we made adjustments. Yeah, I didn't feel like we did enough to to win the game. I think that was my biggest thing. I think you, you win that game by getting the third goal. Now. You know, it's a classic, right? Like, if if that's another player that doesn't score what Graven Birch does there, they're getting slated and vilified, and everyone else is like, ah, he's gotten a good spot. He's got to score that goal, but next time he'll get it. I thought Diaz not getting the ball on frame in the second half when he was put in one-on-one -on -one with the keeper and had the entire, uh, you know, side of the goal to shoot at, and and – doesn't even put it doesn't even work the keeper and we had guys running in. I thought that was like a really big miss as well. I think that was one of the few times where Sobislai 
was able to make like a through pass, set Diaz in. He was one on one with the keeper. You got to get that on net. I mean, we 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 talk about it all the time. You, when you're not creating, you have to take your opportunities. And then as the game got later, it looked like we just got tight. The game's in the balance, and Mo's trying to dribble through three people in the box instead of dropping the ball back. I know it's Gomez and not Trent, but at some point, like you can't try to take four guys on, hoping that you'll get to the byline and cut it back. And you know, it just looked like they were waiting for like the moment where they were gonna score, and it just never felt like we were actually pushing for the third. And I think that was my biggest disappointment was it was like we were content with winning two to one and we're no longer the side that can just see out a match two to one just because we took a two one lead in the first half. So speaking of teams that <clears throat> maybe didn't live up to the billing or surely didn't make it up for the match of the weekend. Um, for me, it was a bit of a snooze fest. If it wasn't for the talking points in the first half, I don't really know. Uh, that it would have been all that exciting or interesting. I even went back and watched the match highlights to see if I missed anything, and I realized quickly I really didn't. Um, so we have to talk about it. I thought we'd get through an entire Premier League show without talking about VAR or bad refereeing decisions. Um, but, you know, with these two still images on the screen, someone will have to explain to me how Manchester City finished with 10 or with 11 men on the pitch. So first off, uh, in chronological order, starting with the first foul, are you giving a straight red to Odega or to Kovacic for the foul on Odegaard, or were you okay with the positioning of where Michael Oliver was and the fact that he felt based on the force it didn't require a red that a yellow was sufficient for the first foul to start? Studs up from directly behind. It's a straight red for me, and I don't even think it's close. Yeah, I didn't understand the first one. The the first one I thought was a straight red. Um, I have even worse of a problem with the fact that they looked at it and and decided that he shouldn't take a look, um, at least take a look. Like, to me, that's that consistency part. You know, there's a few quotes down at the bottom. Um, we'll go through a couple of them here. And then, of course, minutes later, he basically does the exact same challenge with less force, in my opinion, and from the side, to your point, not straight from behind, uh, to Declan Rice, and is called for the foul. And they don't even deem that that's a yellow card. And this is where I have the real problem. My real problem is the second yellow not being given because it's only not given because he's just branded the yellow moments earlier. Because there's no possible way you see that second foul on Rice and don't give a card. You know these guys talk all the time. And we know that they have weekly trainings. And we know that they have like weekly touch points and probably highlight certain things. And you know they talked about the Jota situation. To me, it's almost like they had a conversation where like, hey, let's – we're gonna be we're gonna be fairly lenient on the second yellow within the time frame. It almost feels like that conversation was had. And for me, it's like, can we have the smarter conversation? Can we have the conversation that really matters? And that is like, hey, if we don't know and something's close, we're gonna call you to have we're gonna call you the monitor to have a look at it. And it doesn't mean that we want you to overturn the call. It means we want you to see it again so you can get a better look at it because it's close. Like and I feel like I feel like we've gotten to the point where like if somebody's going to the monitor, it means because it's getting overturned. And I don't think that was ever the intent. Like I don't think that that no. was the intent of having it. And so like I, it's just another example of the technology being there in the actual application being misapplied by these absolute idiots. And I don't know like how long the sport has to suffer because like this point, people don't even know the rules anymore. We don't know the rules. I mean, we'll get into it in our podcast later about the Sobo Sly and whether it's a scoring opportunity. But, like, we just don't know the rules on these things. And I'll tell you, like, I love a good conspiracy theory. Uh, I tend to not try to get into those because I think the people that subscribe to them are generally, for the most part, pretty unintelligent. But for those that have the conspiracy theory that the UAE is involved and that they have a vested interest in seeing City win this title, this game – did not give anyone any less information or ammunition, especially after I watched the first offside call of the game where it looked like the Arsenal dude was onside to me and scored. 
And like, they didn't look at it. They didn't do anything. They just went right along and they showed it back. And like the commentator was like, Ooh, that's close. And like moved on. Like, I just think this is a snapshot and this was the worst moment, but I felt like this was a microcosm for the entire game. And that's, that's really scary. Yeah. And, and, you know, and obviously, you know, I had some tweets here that I had found, you know, on, on the screen as well, you know, Mark Ogden saying Curtis Jones sent off last week, referee went to the screen to check severity of foul. Kovacic stays on after referee doesn't check screen to assess severity of foul on bar review consistency, you know, Charles Watts genuinely staggering that Kovacic didn't get sent off today. How on earth did he get away with that? The second foul was mad. So soon after the first awful from Michael Oliver. And to me, you know, as a Liverpool supporter, this basically is says it all. When Mark Goldbridge is going to, to, you know, two weeks in a row, basically defending Manchester City, Arsenal, and Liverpool, basically against the PJMOL, with disgrace again from the PJMOL, the COVID tackle is worse than Jones and Gusto, and they give a yellow? What's the point anymore? The game is broken. Zero consistency week after week. And – you know, we talk a lot about Goldbridge. We like to poke fun at him. We know that he he does great work for clicks. He's honestly taken a fan site like ours to hosting a uh, phone-in talk show every Sunday on Talk Sport. He is now a paid celebrity doing what he loves. So, albeit for me to begrudge anyone for screaming about stupid things, I once yelled about kids begging for jerseys. Okay, people? Anything for some clicks. But the truth of the matter is, um, he's right. He's spot on. He was spot on last week. He was spot on when he called out Gary Neville. You know, here's a United supporter calling out a United legend, saying, like, don't be biased about Liverpool and the and the refereeing. This is – we need to all support Liverpool in this spot because we're supporting football at this point. I think Goldbridge has been 100% right when it comes to the refereeing and how the – FA, the PGOMOL, how they're all basic. I don't want to say conspiring because I, like you, hate conspiracy theorists because I'll be honest, I don't even want to talk anymore about referee decisions at this point. I feel like it's just gone so far. It makes us sound like we're whining. But every week it's something else. But the match went on. And as the match went on, it got deeper and deeper. And I kept saying, like, is this match really going to end nil-nil? Is it going to end like Holland's just going to score some fluke goal? And then Martinelli scores some fluke-ass goal. Um, great work by Arsenal. They come down the wing. You know, the shape of Ake's face is like a bell, and he just couldn't get that thing out of the way. <laughs> he turned it sideways, and the next thing you know, that thing flew 100 yards to the right, and Ederson's laying on his ass like, are you kidding me? Like, this is a perfect sign. Right here, I think Ake is actually saying out loud, own fucking goal like the ball is coming at his dome and the only reason he saves any face literally is because the ball was on frame but ederson was gonna catch it like it wasn't even like and it, it's just one of those goals right martinelli's a super talented player arsenal end the 12 match losing streak which blows my mind it wasn't 12 matches on you know winless it was 12 yeah. matches losing that's like, wild six years um, of losing this fixture back and back, you know, obviously big step forward for Arsenal. It leaves the table. We'll quickly look at the table here. Um, it leaves the table with Tottenham at 20, Arsenal 20, Man City 18, Liverpool 17, Villa 16, Brighton 16, West Ham 14. I mean, that is a pretty stacked up top of the table. I will just, we'll, we'll we have like, Two minutes left here, Paul. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about match week nine um, when we do this show during the Premier League break, you know, because there's no matches. We'll also focus a little bit more on like midseason awards, you know, or, you know, third of the way awards. We'll look at manager of the year, teams that are surprising us, who we feel will go down, that kind of stuff. Does this end up being a 3 4 team title race? Like, could this be the year City takes the step back and everyone takes a little step forward? Or do you still see it being, you know, Liverpool and City or Arsenal and City fighting it out down the stretch here? 
<clears throat> well, I think City being two points off top, you know, like we're not used to seeing that, right? But I'm not going to count City out. Like we've seen this before, especially this time of year. Like I, I don't feel comfortable saying that this is the year they step back until we get to the end of January and they're like, you know, still a couple points off the lead. Because what I suspect will happen, what historically has happened, is in January they basically turn into a transformer and they don't lose matches the rest of the year. Like nothing. So um, it's a wait and see. But I, what I will say about this team is that they are thinner than this this side has ever been. And I think the top end, I think they have the top end quality, but I think there's some significant gaps in the side that we haven't seen historically with the city side. Yeah, I think when you when you talk about the fact that Holland's struggling the way he has, and you know it's been four of the last five matches without a goal or an assist. Um, or any attacking returns, which for a guy who doesn't do a lot other than score goals, that's when you start to really become a passenger on the pitch. Um, I think that he's he's missing De Bruyne, obviously. I think he's also, and no one wants to talk about this because the guy got no credit, I think they miss Riyad Mahrez because all Riyad Mahrez did was score big yeah. goals and big moments, just like Gundogan. Everyone talks about Gundogan. Gundogan's not here. We miss Gundogan. I think they don't realize how much they miss Riyad Mahrez because he would just go 11 matches without a start but he'd have five goals and two assists during that 11 matches. Then on the 12th match, he'd start and he'd get a brace to win it. Um, And I I think that's a big one. You know, Grealish has been out for the last few weeks as well. They're, they're weaker in the midfield. Obviously first time I can remember them losing three on the spin in a long time. Um, The way that they did in England to Newcastle wolves and Arsenal and all of that corresponds with Rodri not being in the lineup, their most influential player. And, you know, John Stones, who you could argue was their best defender all last season, has been out most of this year. So if these players continue to stay out and Bernardo Silva misses more time, I could see it being a problem. All that being said, I could also see them buying three players in January that they need and getting on a run. And, you know, you make the comment, if it's the end of January and they're not in first, I'll think about them not winning. Last year at the end of January, Arsenal only had an eight-point lead, still figured out a way to lose the lose the league by five points. Sure. And City gave up with two weeks to go because they had an 11-point lead by then. So I'm not, I'm not saying they won't. Maybe I'm just taking the dumb and dumber standpoint here that, like, this table is telling me there's a chance. And I've been waiting (laughs) so long for there to be a chance because I really want a season. I hate to say it. I want a season like the Leicester year. I want a year where you don't believe someone can do it all year. And there's even teams around them like like Tottenham and like other teams like coming down at one point. And someone was like, do you actually believe Leicester will win? And I remember one of the guys on the radio being like, yes, because the alternate is Spurs winning the Premier League title. Like that was the alternate option to Lester bottling it was Spurs were going to come up and pip it. So we'll get out of here on that. Um, really interesting match week. Next week, we will talk a little bit more about what we've seen so far. Uh, we'll, we'll focus a little bit, maybe a little segment on best transfers in. Um, some of the biggest flops. We're looking at you, Kai Havertz, just because you got an assist off an own goal that smacked off some bell face's face does not mean that you get off the list here. Not one bit. You will still be on that list along with everyone that Chelsea bought from all over the world. <laughs> um, we got through a whole show, and you know it's a Premier League show when Chelsea wins 4-1 and we can't find time to bring them up. But there was just so much good stuff to talk about this week. Sorry, Chelsea supporters. We'll get back to you soon. So for myself, And Paul and all the folks at American Scouser TV, thank you for watching. Please, if you haven't already, go over to the YouTube page. Give the channel a subscribe. Add a like. If you have comments around the shows, let us know. If you'd like to get involved, send us a message and let us know how. We're looking for volunteers all the time. Enjoy the shows, everyone, and we will be back next week. Thanks. Have a great week.